Lying has become commonplace in our world today. It is difficult to tell who's lying and who's telling the truth, even among the clergy. How can we learn to spot a lie? Welcome back. I promise you this would be an epic journey through the unseen. We are nearing the end of our journey. I hope each episode has been an eye opener and a turning point for you. This one should be no different. This is the 12th part of a 13 part series designed to help us discern the truth from lies. There are things and entities around us that we cannot see, hear, or even imagine. And if not careful, we can be deceived by them. We are in a war between the forces of good and evil. Every move we make, every step we take, points us in the direction of good or evil. We are in a war for our souls. It is designed to strip us of our relationship with God, His Word, and what is true. We have been looking at this cosmic battle, exploring the origin of sin, the nature of evil, its history, and what will lead to the ultimate showdown between good and evil, Christ and Satan. This series is about how could we know the truth, but as we always do, let's take a moment to ask God's help. And if you have not viewed the previous videos, go back and view them at sabbathschooldaily.com. Heavenly Father, there are so many voices claiming to be telling the truth. We need your help in discerning the truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Imagine standing on the brink of an impending storm, not just any storm, but one that promises to be beyond an existing category. It is forecast to shake the very foundation of our world. In fact, this is no mere weather forecast. It is a tempest stirred by unseen powers that stand at the doorstep of every life. Preparation for this storm demands that we can discern the truth from a lie. How can we spot the truth from a lie? Proverbs 23, 23 tells us to buy the truth and do not sell it. Also wisdom and instruction and understanding. In other words, with whatever resources and abilities we have, we are advised to obtain the truth. And once obtained, we are not to cast it away. In companionship with the truth, we are admonished to seek wisdom, instructions, and understanding. It is by doing this that we will be able to manage the terrible storm about to come upon us. Now imagine yourself as a parent with a son or a daughter driving home from college from summer vacation. While waiting, a news flash comes on, warning that a terrible storm is coming. As the winds grow stronger, you become worried. Then the thunders roar, the lightning flash, and the sky opens up and the rain starts to pour. You hear that the trees are blown down, making the main roads leading to the house impassable. Then you hear another report that the major roadways leading to your home are blocked by fallen trees. However, one of your neighbors tell you that some of the side streets are open and cars can navigate around the down trees. Now, communications by phone has become difficult, but with a pounding heart, you're able to give a text to your child, carefully instructing him or her through the perils and directing him or her on how to maneuver around the destruction. You carefully give your child the best route to take to arrive home safely. How did your child arrive home safely? They trusted that you told them the truth. This scenario mirrors what Jesus wants for us. More than anything, Jesus wants us to trust that he will lead us through the storms of life and get us safely home. Jesus, our God, desires nothing more than to lead us through life's tormentous storms to a place of eternal safety. But we must be able to trust that he is giving us the truth. 
A storm is coming, relentless in theory. The question is, are you prepared to meet it? Though we may not realize it, Christ's life, death, resurrection, and work in heaven's sanctuary ensure that we can trust him to help us arrive home safely. The prophetic teachings of Daniel and Revelation are divine directions prepared especially for his end time people. They are designed to help us through life storms so that we would relieve in joyful hearts may fall into the arms of our loving Savior. We delve deep into the scriptures to discover the key to enduring earth's final conflicts. We look at the closing events to discover the truth and learn about the strength of Christ that is able to take us through earth's final conflict and get us home. The key to maneuvering the impending storm is truth. God's word is truth. What do you do with it and where can you find it? Read again Proverbs 23, 23, and also John 8, 32, and John 17, 17. Then continue to part two, loyalty to God and his word. Proverbs 23, 23, John 8, 32, and John 17, 17, touch on a single truth. This truth is the liberating power of divine wisdom and understanding. Proverbs 23, 23 says, buy the truth and do not sell it. Also wisdom and instruction and understanding. John 8, 32, and you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. John 17, 17, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Throughout history, the great controversy between God and Satan has been a battle between truth and error, God's truth and Satan's lies. John 8, 44 clearly identifies that Satan is a liar and the father of lies. You are of your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources for he is a liar and the father of it. In contrast, John 14, 6, we see that Jesus is the embodiment of truth. He assures us of this saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The truth that frees us from Satan's lies and helps us to spot Deception is contained in God's word. The scriptures are true. They expose Satan's lies and schemes and illuminate our past so that we can arrive home. As Psalms 119.105 says, they are like lamps that light the way in darkness. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Moreover, the psalmist declares in Psalms 119.130, the entrance of your words give light. It gives understanding to the simple. He adds in Psalms 119, 160, the entirety of your word is truth. He adds in Psalms 119, 160, the entirety of your word is truth. Peter in 2 Peter 1, 16 through 21, reinforces the authenticity of God's word saying, for we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitness of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when such a voice came to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And we heard this voice which came from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this verse, that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the will of man, but by holy men of God, spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Want to know how to spot the truth from a lie? Knowing God's word 
arms us against deception. It fortifies our minds with the wisdom to discern the genuine from the counterfeit. The word of God, the scriptures, are not cunningly devised fables. Therefore, the prophecies in the scriptures illuminate the road ahead. They give us the instructions and wisdom we need to help us distinguish truth from a lie. Without the Bible, we would be left at the mercy of human opinions and easily deceived. Notice what it says in the great controversy about our safeguard against lies. The people of God are directed to the scriptures as their safeguard against the influence of false teachers and the delusive powers of spirits of darkness. The last great delusion is soon to open before us. Antichrist is to perform his marvelous works in our sight. So closely will the counterfeit resemble the truth that it will be impossible to distinguish between them except by the Holy Scriptures. As we stand on the edge of time, armed with the light of Scripture, we must ask ourselves, will we choose obedience to God or succumb to Satan's lines? The battle lines are drawn and the final test is approaching. How can we be shielded against the coming raging storm and stand firm in the faith of Jesus? View the next segment of this video, part three, Sealed for Heaven. We stand at the threshold of a momentual conflict between good and evil, the truth and lies. It's crucial to understand the very core of this battle is about worship and allegiance. Therefore, we look at God's mark, a divine seal of authenticity and ownership as laid out in scripture. Revelation 14, 12 tells us that God's people will not give up their faith or break his divine law. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. It is not just about observance, it's about identity and truth in the face of deception. The impending test of our times will revolve fundamentally around worship. According to Ephesians 4.30, the Holy Spirit will seal God's people, signifying their unwavering commitment to reject the worship of the sea beast and his image. Thus, Ephesians 4.30 tells us, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. In ancient times, a seal attests to the authenticity of official documents. Each seal had a distinctive individualized mark. Similarly, God's seal identifies his authority. It is embedded in his law, thereby identifying those who belong to him, as Isaiah expresses in Isaiah 8.16, saying, Bind up the testimony, seal up the law among my disciples. In examining the Sabbath commandment found in Exodus 20, verse 8 through 11, we observe three critical components of this divine seal. One, the name to whom the seal belongs, the Lord thy God. Two, his title, the one who made us, the creator. Three, his territory, heaven, earth, the sea and all that in them is. This establishes the Sabbath, not just as a day of rest, but as a divine sign of God's sovereignty and a testament to his creation. In the Bible, a seal is sometimes called a sign, as in Romans 4, 11. The two words, sign and seal, are interchangeable. Therefore, the Sabbath, as God's sign or seal in the heart of his law, is at the center of the final conflict of worship. Notice what it says in the following scriptures, Ezekiel 20, verse 12. Moreover, I also give them my Sabbath to be a sign between them and me, that they may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies them. Ezekiel 20, 20, call on my Sabbaths, and they will be a sign between me and you, that you may know that I am the Lord your God. Revelation 12, 17. And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring, 
who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. In comparing Revelation 7, 1 and 2 and Revelation 14, 1 with Revelation 13, 17, we see in the placement of the seal of God versus the mark of the beast. Notice that God's seal is placed on the forehead, symbolizing a conscious intellectual acceptance of divine authority as reflected in one's thoughts and decisions. On the other hand, the mark of the beast is received on the forehead. This indicates that people are convinced intellectually. They, by their own choice, accept Satan's lies, or they receive the mark of the beast in the hand, expressing that they conform to the false worship to avoid being killed. The truth is, the devil hates those who are obedient to God. Therefore, the great controversy, the battle between good and evil, truth and lies, come to a climax when the dragon, Satan, wages war on the remaining believing remnants who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus, as expressed in Revelation 14, 12. This group is settled in their minds on their loyalty to Christ. As we embrace the truth, we must allow it to reinforce our hearts and minds so that we become prepared when facing the ultimate test of faith. In the final conflict, will we accept God's truth or Satan's lies? Continue to the next segment of this video, part four, Whom Do We Worship? The great controversy, the battle between good and evil in the last days will narrow down to worship. Do we worship Jesus, the creator of all, the truth bearer, or Satan, the father of lies? It's our choice, our call. We cannot remain neutral. We all have to make a choice. There is no middle ground. Revelation 14 speaks of this choice. The first angel in Revelation 14, 7, powerfully calls for all to worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and springs of water. This command isn't just a casual invitation. It's a divine directive to recognize the sovereignty of our creator. Consequently, the third angel in Revelation 14, 10 reveals the ugly consequences awaiting those who choose to worship the beast, expressing the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. In contrast, those who remain faithful and worship the creator are described in Revelation 14, 12 as those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. The core of our worship is rooted in creation itself. In it, we honor God who created the universe in six literal days. As our creator, he deserves our honor and our worship, just as is expressed in Revelation 14, 11. You are worthy, O God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they exist and were created. In fact, Ephesians 3, 9 helps us to understand that God created all things through Jesus Christ. Therefore, Jesus is our maker and our redeemer. This is what Satan hates. He resents Jesus, our creator. This is why he has worked so hard to keep us humans from acknowledging Jesus as our creator. To accomplish this, historically, Satan has manipulated leaders to change God's sacred time with us, particularly his Sabbath, which serves as a memorial of his creation. This is the point that Daniel 7, 25 makes when he says, he shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and shall intend to change times and law. Then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time and a time and half time. By attempting to eliminate Sabbath worship, Satan aims to claim dominion over earth, challenging God's authority and claiming that his authority is greater than God's authority. This he will do by attempting to convince or coerce the entire world to accept his lie of a counterfeit Sabbath. 
as expressed in the study guide, regardless of how hard it may be now to see this happening, the world is changing dramatically. The COVID-19 crisis showed us that overnight, our world can become a different place. Though we don't know the details that will lead to the mark of the beast, it is not difficult to imagine. Our world is very unstable. And with the amazing technology we have, the things that the Bible warned us about can happen more quickly than we can now imagine. The consequences for those who resist the mark of the beast are severe. Revelation 13, 13 to 17 outlines a world where no economic transactions can occur without allegiance to the beast, which culminates in a death decree against God's faithful people. In other words, those who are faithful to Christ, as opposed to those who follow the beast and its image, will face economic sanctions as well as the threat of death. Therefore, humanity, as expressed in the study guide, remains what it has always been, corrupt, power hungry, and violent. This should come as no surprise. John 2.25, talking about Jesus, states, he had no need that anyone should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. As we face these turbulent times, it is crucial to understand the stakes involved. The decisions we make about whom we worship is not just for today, but for eternity. We must brace ourselves armed with the truth of scripture. The scripture exposes Satan's lies. Also, Joel 2, 21 through 24 admonishes us not to be afraid, but to rejoice and be glad. With such a dire future, how can we? Read Joel 2, 21 through 24 and Acts 2, 1 through 4 and 41 through 47. Then continue to the next segment of this video, part five, the early and latter rain. In biblical prophecy and fulfillment, we witness the remarkable interaction of God's promise and their realization in the lives of his people. The prophet Joel's words came to life at Pentecost, setting the stage for the future completion of God's mission on earth. Joel prophesied that the Lord would pour out his spirit upon his people. This divine promise was fulfilled during Pentecost. This event marked a pivotal moment in the history of the Christian church. As Jesus ascended to heaven, the Holy Spirit descended upon his followers. This outpouring resulted in a series of miracles and incredible expansions of the church. Acts records miracle after miracle displaying God's transforming grace. For it says in Acts 4, 4, many of those who heard the word believed and the number of the men came to about 5,000. From a humble gathering of 120 believers in prayer, the church experienced explosive growth. That small prayer meeting resulted in 3,000 souls being converted in a single day, and soon after, the number grew to about 5,000. This small congregation rapidly added thousands of believers. In fact, Acts 6-7 tells us that even a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. That is, many priests became followers of Jesus. Persecution did not stop them. When the disciples in Jerusalem were scattered because of it, Acts 8, 4 says that they went everywhere preaching the word. The disciples went throughout all Judea, Samaria, and Galilee, according to Acts 9, 31. Then the churches throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace and were edified. And walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, they were multiplied. The disciples sharing the gospel aided in adding new churches and in causing existing churches to grow. After Paul's conversion, he too proclaimed the gospel of Christ, sharing it throughout the Mediterranean world. In Thessalonica, some of the Jews standing against the preaching of the gospel attested, these who have turned the world upside down have come here too. Little did they realize that their words were a powerful testimony to what the early church was able to accomplish 
through the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. In fact, the disciples reached the then known world in a relatively short time. The work at Pentecost fulfilled Joel's prediction of the early rain, but the latter rain was to fall with greater power to prepare the earth for its final harvest. So this initial outpouring of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost was just the beginning. As Joel's prophecy also speaks of a latter rain that will occur with even greater power to prepare the world for Jesus' second coming. To understand how God will finish his work on earth, we turn to the agricultural metaphor found in Zechariah 4, 6, Zechariah 10, 1, Hosea 6, 3, and James 5, 7, and 8. Zechariah 4, 6. So he answered and said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Zechariah 10, 1. Ask the Lord for rain in the time of the latter rain. The Lord will make flashing clouds. He will give them showers of rain, grass in the field for everyone. Hosea 6, 3. Let us know, let us pursue the knowledge of the Lord. His going forth is established as the morning. He will come to us like the rain, like the latter and former rain to the earth. In James 5, 7 through 8. Therefore, be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and latter rain. You also be patient. Establish your heart, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. These passages liken the Holy Spirit's work to the early and latter rains essential for the growth and maturation of crops. As the study guides points out, the term early and latter rain are taken from Israel's harvest cycle. The early rain fell in the fall of the year to germinate the seed, and the latter rain fell in the spring to ripen the harvest. This describes the work of the Holy Spirit in proclaiming the gospel. Here's what it says in the great controversy regarding the early and latter rain. As the former rain was given, in the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at the opening of the gospel to cause the upspringing of the precious seeds, so the latter rain will be given at its close for the ripening of the harvest. In other words, the early rains facilitated the initial spread of the gospel, symbolizing the Holy Spirit's role in germinating the seeds of the faith. In contrast, the latter rain will come at the end of time, empowering God's people to bring his work to fruition with unprecedented power and extent. Joel's prophecy and fulfillment demonstrate that God's word is truth. Therefore, we can anticipate his promise of the latter rains, for the same spirit that empowered the early church at Pentecost is still at work today preparing us for the final chapter in God's plan. How will God's work on earth be finished? Read Revelation 18, one through four, Habakkuk 2, 14, and Matthew 24, 14. Then continue to the next segment of this video, part six, the loud cry. As we look toward the culmination of God's plan for humanity, the scriptures paint a vivid picture of a final global awakening. God's work on earth will be completed through a dramatic outpouring of divine power, heralding the ultimate fulfillment of his promises. The imagery in Revelation 18, one through four introduces a powerful angel whose arrival signifies a critical phase in God's unfolding plan. After these things, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great wrath, and the earth was illuminated with his glory. And he cried mightily with a loud voice saying, Babylon the great is fallen. Its fallen has become a dwelling place of demons, a prison for every foul spirit, and a cage for every unclean and hateful bird. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. 
and the merchants of the earth have become rich through the abundance of her luxury. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins and lest you receive of her plagues. This angel, symbolic of God's human messenger, reveals the glory of God so fully that it illuminates the entire earth. Greek word for power used to describe this angel often refers to Christ's triumph over the principalities and powers of hell. Thus, it connects directly to Jesus' authority over evil forces, underscoring the profound impact of divine authority that these messengers proclaim. The same authority is first given to the disciples as recorded in Matthew 10, 1. And when he had called his 12 disciples to him, he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of diseases. Jesus affirms it in Matthew 28, 18, 19, saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go ye therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Jesus empowered them to spread the gospel to all nations. This sets the stage for a future more intense mobilization of God's people. As foretold in Habakkuk 2.14 and Matthew 24.14, the knowledge of God will cover the earth as water covers the sea and the gospel will be proclaimed to all nations as a testimony before the end comes. Habakkuk 2.14 For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. In Matthew 24.14 And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations and then the end will come. Filled with the power of the Holy Spirit moving in the authority of Christ, who in his life and death triumph over the principalities and powers of hell, the New Testament church lightened the earth with the glory of God. In a few short years, the disciples proclaimed the gospel to the then known world as expressed in Colossians 1.23, in which Paul attests saying, if indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard which was preached to every creature under heaven of which i paul became a minister likewise in the final days the holy spirit will be poured out with unprecedented power far exceeding the early days of the church the gospel will be rapidly spread to the ends of the earth depicting god's servants moving rapidly across the globe with their faces aglow with the divine light, performing mighty works in God's name, the great controversy declares the prophecies which were fulfilled in the outpouring of the former rain at the opening of the gospel are again to be fulfilled in the latter rain at its close. Servants of God, with their faces lighting up and shining with holy consecration, will hasten from place to place to proclaim the message from heaven. By thousands of voices all over the earth, the warning will be given, miracles will be wrought, the sick will be healed, and signs and wonders will follow the believers. Let us be inspired by the truth of God's word and the certainty of his promise. How do you spot a lie? Know the truth. God's word is truth. Thank you for watching this video. To be notified when my next video comes out, subscribe to my YouTube channel, Sabbath School Daily by Dr. Brenda Ware Davis. You also may obtain a free study guide for these lessons at sabbath.school or ssnet.org. If you enjoyed this video and want to make it available for your friends and families to watch, click like, then share. Thank you for liking, sharing, and subscribing.